morning and welcome to Words That Matter. I'm Lee Smith and I'm the host uh, of our Modern Day Book Club. Look, I've, this is going to be such a fun show today. Uh, our guest is someone you know, someone you uh, should be following on social media. If you're not, someone who's uh, someone whose organization, their uh, nonprofit, you should be following and you should find a way to help out. Um, this is our uh, friend. He's, he's been with us before. He's spoken with us before. This is the great Mike Benz. Um, so I want to introduce Mike right now. And I want to say what this, what the subject of our show uh, is about today. This is a show about books, modern day book club, but we are interested in books in all sorts of stages. Uh, so we, we interview authors who have a new book out. Uh, we speak with different people who want to talk about an old book that they think is especially relevant to this particular moment, or maybe it just uh, maybe just captures them and they feel they need to express it. We are speaking with Mike Benz today about a book that he is planning, about a book that he has to write. And if you're following Mike Benz on social media, you're seeing Mike say stuff like, I am never going to get to finish this book that I need to write and that I'm dying to write, and it's my life mission. So- our mission today is to get Mike going on his book. We're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about the structure. We're going to talk about the subject. So audience, you're part of a giant writing workshop today that we're conducting. It's going to be so much fun. Mike is, Mike is one of the greatest guys, one of the most brilliant guys out there. We're going to talk about the subject of the book, and we're going to be talking about the writing of the book. Mike Benz, welcome. Thank you. God bless you, man. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being my therapist, crisis <laughs> intervention, you know, uh, confidant in this. Yeah. And I'll, I'll try my best to rip my heart open so that we can we can work out this thing together. You don't have to rip your heart open. What I'm saying is seeing you on social media, I have to write this book. I'm never going to get this book done that you were tweeting about this a little bit uh, during your trip across country, that very exciting trip across country. So I'm like, Mike has to write this book. You and I have spoken about it. And you've talked about all the different problems with writing the book. But I'm like, you have to you have to write it. People need to read it. The subject is important. You're an important writer. So how should we start? Let's talk. Let's start first with what you're writing about, what the book is about and, and why this is turning out to be. Um, then we'll get into the difficulties. But what is the book about? Um and why are you writing it? Well, the book really started way before I even became a part of the story. You know, I started writing it um, totally in the third person. At, you know, it, the, the genesis of this was at the outset, before there even really was a censorship industry, I became very distressed in around August 2016 when I started to see that there were these artificial intelligence uh, speech detection capabilities being funded um, by the federal government to be able to basically do to speech online what chess computers were doing to, you know, Gary Kasparov types in the, in the game of chess. And I wanted to write this book as a sort of warning that these uh, these artificial intelligence super weapons were coming and uh, and the imperative to stop them. But by the time I had already uh, gotten late into the development of that, uh, they were already being rolled out in, uh, in 2017, 2018. So then it sort of switched to talking about the censorship industry. And, uh, and then I sort of became a, a, a part of it. You know, I joined the Trump administration. Uh, I ended up working in the State Department, uh, specifically on the, in the cyber desk that interfaces with those same issues. Uh, and then I've sort of become a part of everything that's going on on the censorship counteroffensive, whether that's the Twitter files, the, the lawsuits, the congressional investigations, the, the media investigations. So it's one of these things where it started off as a relatively simple story hmm. about these incredible uh, AI censorship super weapons and how they were being developed, how they worked, who was behind them, their potential for a, a true doomsday scenario uh, for for free speech in the Western world, uh, but then you know, getting deeper into that, it sort of became about the infrastructure of the censorship industry, how it was that the whole thing developed, who the who's behind it, the the money networks, how the government, the private sector, civil society, and news media and fact checking all got together into this whole of society. And the issue is, is 
you know, one of the reasons that I joke that, you know, you'll be able to pre-order this thing in 200 years <laughs> is to understand the censorship industry, you actually need to understand so many other elements of how our world works and and how the American empire is structured to to really make sense of the cast of characters involved. So just one last thing is, you know, in the past several months, some of the things that, that have gone viral that, that I've published seem to have very little to do with censorship, a lot of people say. You know, I've this thing on, on the geopolitics of West Texas and the liquefied natural gas markets yeah. and uh, and how that relates to Iran and, and Russia. Well, to understand the evolution of the censorship industry, you need to understand the energy industry. You need to understand the military industry and finance. You need to understand the history of the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department. And so what you're really doing, I think, what needs to be done as a sort of comprehensive tome so that people can digest everything all at once in one place is kind of a, a sweeping secret history of how the modern world was made. Fascinating. Um, that's okay. So that's the subtitle. We've already got the subtitle for the book, the secret history of how the modern world was made. That's fantastic. The way you're describing it, this is one of the things that really interested me when you're talking about it before, but not just in terms of the subject. And I want to get into the subject later, the stuff that you're saying that you really need to understand before we get to censorship industry, but the, the way that, that you've become a part of the story. Right. Seriously, in terms of a narrative, in terms of telling a story, that couldn't be more exciting, right? Because it sort of starts off in the third person. You're looking at all this stuff, and then all of a sudden you get dragged into it, right? That you are one of the leading players. So in that way, it's kind of a first person spy thriller. I think it sounds great. The way you're describing it, the way you're talking about the trajectory is fascinating. So is one of your concerns that some of this uh, some of the detail that people need to know, like about um, about the history of the CIA, about the energy industry. Do you think that that is so much information? It's going. That's what's making the book uh, in your head and in your writing more and more sprawling. Or can this be sort of narrowed down and say, well, here's ten, fifteen pages on the energy industry at present. At present, like um, you know, the, the LNG stuff that you've been talking about some on social media, which is fascinating, and I think it's a real key to what's happening now. Do you think that that just kind of overwhelms the book? Yes, but it's it's also necessary. Yeah. You know, someone's someone's got to write that story, and if you scatter it in too many different places. It's not all centralized. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, my dream is it's just one of those matrix type things that you just plug this book into your skull on Audible <laughs> and a month later, you know, Kung Fu. And, <laughs> and how, like, however long it takes to tell that, like, it has to be comprehensively told. And because all these things are such a, they're, they're, they're all so relevant to, to yeah. the modern world. And, and like, so for example, you know, e even the the term censorship industry. You know, it's mm. so much bigger than than censorship. But mm. to understand even the even the the role that our government has played in in free speech and mm. exporting, uh, you know, exporting principles of free speech for the purpose of soft power projection abroad. I mean, this was a huge mm. part of what our national security, state, and foreign policy establishment did. You know, with with. Mm. Wisner's Wurlitzer, Frank Wisner, one of the godfathers of the CIA, and 800 different proprietary media companies that were all funded by the U.S. government or had editorial liaisons. And so this whole toolkit we had, we've had for an entire century to be able to turn up the knobs of government mm -hmm. propaganda or of soft power projection, it was not until only a few years ago that the capacity was developed to actually turn down opposing nods, it, it, knobs. And that that is a world of difference in terms of whether you even have a fighting chance against propaganda. If Wait, you can't I'm, I'm even sorry, what, what, what do you mean by it. what do you mean by turning down the opposing knobs? That's that's a really interesting image. What do you mean? So you can think of information economies as, as comprising sort of ways of turning knobs up of your mm -hmm. own volume as, as if it was a stereo uh, or ways of turning down the speech of opposition voices who oppose you. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of propaganda 
and you know high intensity government propaganda is the government turning up its own knob you know we saw this in covid everywhere you looked it was stephen colbert and a bunch of dancing yeah. syringes you know you walk through times square and you're being clockworked oranged by by you know propaganda right. in a 360 degree 4k way um but that is a terrifying thing hmm. and, and dystopic in its own element but you still theoretically have a fighting chance if you can convince people not to believe it hmm. and to buy your narrative instead it in the 20th century the national security state had a big problem with left-wing groups who opposed the vietnam war a lot of this got rolled into the hippie movement the musical movements hmm. the civil rights movement there was a really strong groundswell from youth and concerned parents in in this country who did not want their boys coming home in body bags but mm -hmm. the the military had a real problem with this how do you deal with the fact that that this is an organic movement it's it's rapidly growing mm -hmm. and if they are successful we lose our funding and we lose the war now they tried to do this by a sort of propaganda campaign by infiltrating left-wing student groups there was a big thing called Operation Chaos with the Central Intelligence Agency, where they literally hmm. paid the National Students Union and infiltrated college campuses. You know, this is the Central Intelligence Agency. It's supposed to be a foreign facing department of dirty tricks. And yet here it was infiltrating 18, 19, 20 year olds on, on college campuses. But there was never a situation in the 20th century where you would be around the dinner table talking about, you know, opposition to the Vietnam War and the CIA could just reach into the into the table and turn your volume down to zero when you started saying keywords around around no more war. That capability exists and it exists at a scale, speed and comprehensiveness now that was never available to des despots in the 20th century. Wow. And and when you understand how it's been folded into the toolkit for everything from soft power projection to electioneering to even operational security. If, if we get busted, uh, you know, doing an op in, in, uh, in country X or in region X, it's now a part of the operational security playbook to work with the big tech teams to censor every, you know, news stories about our own bad deeds. So as this gets folded into the Department of Dirty Tricks toolkit in a more and more seamless way, we, have, we completely lose all notions of democratic representation whatsoever because we can't even begin the consensus building process to change the government if the government has the ability right. to foreclose that at, at the early level and so we're not just up against propaganda anymore we're up against our not even being able to have our own knobs in in the game right so how do how do, i mean this, i'm sure this is in itself a long story but how did how did this happen because this is uh this, I mean, this in itself is fascinating. We're going to go back and talk about the book more. I mean, this is a central part of it. This is something that happens late in your story, right? Finding out that, uh, finding out that now the government has the ability to, uh, to turn down the knob. How did it happen? Is it strictly a function of the internet? Yes, I mean, in in some respects. I mean, it's an out. The internet itself is an outgrowth of the soft power projection strategy of the american government also the british and and some of our nato allies but you know the internet itself was a soft power projection tool that only became private it privatized you know it started as a darpa project to help darpa manage social science research for counterinsurgency during the mm -hmm. vietnam war this was this is the origins and and you can read um you know uh i think uh, uh surveillance valley by yasha levine is a good mm -hmm. book on that uh, with some of the, the counterinsurgency information management uh, origins uh, of the internet. But in 1991, the World Wide Web came out. That's the year the Cold War ended. Mm -hmm. And we basically, uh, you had the Defense Department, the State Department, the CIA, and the National Security Council, all basically looking at this new internet as a kind of new voice of America. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the voice of America was, after World War II, actually, so a lot of the story here is about how the American empire really got its, its kickstart first fighting fascism in world war II, then fighting communism during the cold mm -hmm. war. And then there was, you know, what the foreign policy establishment sort of thinks of as like the golden era of the nineties and early aughts, where it was the unipolar moment. And then right. they started losing 
of referendums and elections in 2014, 2015, 2016. Hmm. And the, the same tools that were used to fight fascism and then communism were redirected domestically to fight domestic populism. And the means for doing so, because the threat was coming from the internet, it became an internet story in the sense that all of the freedom technologies, and we've spoken about this on, on, on our conversations before, but internet freedom itself was very much a meme of the US national security state. I mean, the reason that we feel so strongly about a free internet is only partially a function of the American spirit of free speech. Uh, we didn't always have a total spirit of free speech in this country, despite a First Amendment. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth waves on that. But the internet, we were always gung ho on freedom on. But a lot of that was because that was where the money was, and that was that was the foreign policy consensus. For example, the the freedom technologies around VPNs, virtual private networks. Mm-hmm to be able to hide your IP address. Well, all the technology for VPNs were created by DARPA and, and the CIA and NSA to be able to help dissident groups abroad who we were trying to capacity build to overthrow their own governments to evade IP detection by so-called authoritarian governments. And to end encrypted chats were a DARPA project to be able to, you know, to, be able to have confidential communications that the government couldn't detect so that we could work with those dissident groups to overthrow their, their governments. Same thing with Tor, the dark web, you know, to be able to buy and sell goods and be able to have a sort of whole underground commerce. That was also a DARPA project. All of these things around freedom and anonymity and, and free and open speech uh, and dissident ideas, those were all our idea for the first 25 years of the internet because it was helpful for the empire. The problem is, is when social media began to get so mature that a random shit poster could develop more internet influence than the New York Times, mm. suddenly this became a national security threat because they started <laughs> losing elections. They started losing you know, the, the Brexit referendum. You know, they you, lost in, in, in Crimea in 2014. They lost the 2016 election. You know, they, they almost lost France. They lost Italy. They lost Brazil. They right. lost India. You used an image before when we were speaking before about, um, you know, their one big giant shark or whale. And then all these minnows got together and formed a mass that was bigger than the shark. And they scared the heck out of the shark. And what they've done now is they've come together and they've amassed all their sharks to chew up all the minnows. Look, Mike, this is great. We've got to cut away for a little. Le- we're going to be back in less than a minute. Uh, folks who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, shame on you. Uh, make sure that you cut away. We're jumping to Epoch TV. We will see us exclusively on Epoch TV. Fantastic conversation here with the great Mike Benz. We're talking about the book he's working on, the book he has to write. We're talking about the subject. We're talking about the censorship industry. And and Mike is really uh, showing us the, the real pillars here, how this was built and where we are now. Make sure to make the jump. We'll see you in less than a minute here on Epoch TV. The center of corruption is the Department of Justice. Charles Grassley has been going after them, identifying how the FBI and DOJ withheld evidence from the American people, from Congress, for six years regarding Biden family corruption. Where is the rest of Congress? Senator Grassley, and joined by Chairman Comer, who's on the House side, they wrote a letter basically to the FBI and said, we are aware of the existence of a form that contains allegations regarding a bribery scheme involving Joe Biden himself. Then it turns out, hey, the document's real. They got it. There were 17 phone calls that the source had recorded involving Joe Biden or Hunter Biden talking about the bribery scheme. The FBI redacted that information to the American people. This is the FBI we're talking about. This is corruption of the president we're talking about. It's you get the documents, you get the witnesses, you get them under oath, you move forward. You don't play on their terms, you play on your terms. 